Well, good evening and welcome to tonight's live stream from St John's Asquith. And a particular welcome if this is the first event at St John's Asquith that you've tuned into on the live stream. Uh, my name's Andrew, I'm a member here at St John's uh, and it's, it's great to have you with us tonight as we tackle the topic of managing mental health uh, in lockdown. Um, I'd firstly like to uh, acknowledge uh, the country on which I sit at least. Um, you may be on the same country or you may be on different country. Um, but where I am, uh, it's the traditional lands of the Darug and the Gurungai people and we pay our respects to Elders past, present uh, and emerging and we acknowledge uh, that it's God who gives all people uh, all good things. Um, but it's also my great pleasure to introduce Colleen Hurst tonight. Welcome Colleen. Uh, and thank you for joining us for this seminar. Um, now, Colleen's a clinical psychologist and a family therapist um, with over 30 years experience in the counselling industry. Uh, renowned, Colleen, I believe, for your warm and relational style, which we look forward to meeting tonight. Um, and with a lot of clinical experience, uh, look, with a whole range of stuff really, ranging from counselling, uh, you know, abuse, youth work, a whole range of stuff. So thank you for joining us to, to share your experience. We, we really appreciate having you here. Um, the way that tonight's going to work is, is really the first part of the night, we'll hear from Colleen uh, some of her, her wisdom and tips for managing mental health. I think it's fair to say that the last two years are unprecedented, at least in our generation. Certainly, um, you know, grandparents and others went through some tough times, but for our generation, it's probably the most unprecedented time we've had, um, the pandemic of the last two years. Uh, we'll then have a short break uh, with a song. And then um, uh, we'll come back and uh, Colleen will answer questions uh, for anyone who has questions. Now we do have an SMS number tonight that you can SMS questions to uh, and it'll come up on the screen uh, in just a moment. Um, but if you want to SMS your questions, uh, 0402 423282 and you can send them through as Colleen's talking uh, or during the break uh, and we'll come to them uh, after the song and the break. Uh, and we'll see how we go. But completely anonymous, um, it's a mobile that doesn't have any names in it, uh, so feel free to ask away. Uh, and you know, if you're a bit uncomfortable with your question, you can always ask it on behalf of a friend, because uh, we're all friends here. They're the best sort of they are, aren't they? Um, now, Colleen, before we hear from you, I'd like to ask you just a few questions so we can get to know you a bit. Uh, what's family for you? <laughs> I felt locked down and, and having a cigarette home. Oh, look, that's nice. It's all happening, obviously, at your place. Um, on the topic of your place, you actually live in an LGA of concern, I believe. Yeah. What's that been like? Okay. okay. I actually live in an LGA of concern and I work in an LGA of concern. So I'm one of those people who has to have a travel permit to be able to go to work. And I think the most daunting thing in working somewhere like Maryland is, I'm not sure, have I not got this turned on? Oh, sorry, technical issues. There we go. Working now? Oh, okay. Hey. Um, <laughs> yes, I do. I live in a lockdown of LGA and I work in a lockdown LGA. Um, most daunting thing in Maryland has been the constant helicopters, um, the police blockades and the army. So that's the army, I haven't seen them for a few weeks, but constantly police and helicopters. So that's been pretty intimidating for the local community in Maryland, in southwestern Sydney. That's yeah, wow. And I mean, we can't even fathom what that's been like here in Ascus because we haven't had any of that. Um, in fact, I actually don't know anyone with one degree of separation who's had COVID. I know people with two, uh, you know, friends of friends who've had it. But how close have you come to COVID? Wow. <laughs> We've had um, one of our staff tested positive to COVID. Um, she's not far from this area, actually, and she brought COVID into Maryland, so the irony of that. <laughs> um, so we did have admin was close contact and had to self-quarantine. So we had to do the deep clean, which costs a lot of money, but yeah. we were given an all clear pretty quickly. Um, we've had clients now coming into the practice who've had COVID and recovered. So it's kind of old news for them yeah. and they're, they're the best um, vaccinated from having had COVID. And so we also have 
Western Sydney, I think, is the fourth or fifth most multicultural place on the planet. So we also have lots of folk who have family in other countries, and so there's lots of stories of death. Mm. There's, there's lots and lots of stories, tragic stories from other countries. Yeah, look, that's very confronting, isn't it? Mm. Um, finally, before you speak to us, what made you decide to go into counselling? It's a wonderful service, and I take my hat off to people like yourself who are in it, but what made you decide to go into it? Um, when, when I was a teenager, I was a wayward youth and did get involved in some um, really unhelpful things. And I, this is not the time to go into the detail. And a, a friend invited me, I was in my last year in high school, and a friend invited me to a youth camp, a guy. And um, I actually thought he liked me, he was pretty hot. But when I got to the camp, he introduced me to his girlfriend. So I was stuck at this Christian camp. <laughs> um, and at this camp, I encountered something really different. I actually met a God who loved me, and that it was absolutely life-changing for me. And because of that, because of that change in my life, it actually changed a whole lot of negative things. And for me, there was no other option but to try and share that same life-changing experience with other people. And I think psychology was the clear direction, the clear way to go. Because all truth comes from God and the sound principles in psych theory is really solidly based in, in the word, in the scriptures. So Fantastic. It's, this is powerful. I couldn't not do it. Well, I think you've given us a wonderful teaser for what's about to come. <laughs> uh, over to you and okay. uh, keen to hear your wisdom in managing our mental health in okay. the uncertain times in which we in live. In these unprecedented times. Well, on the, the front slide, I've got a picture of someone bending in the wind. So I'm hoping you can see that. Um, the reason I've put that up there is world-renowned um, psychiatrist, a guy called Dan Siegel, talks about the, the hallmarks of good mental health is being able to be adaptable and flexible. So no matter what life throws at us, if we can bend with the wind, if we can ride the storm, um, if we can claim the scripture that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me and that he's got this, then we're actually going to ride the lockdown and the whole pandemic wave um, with a lot better mental health. It's really interesting, this latest lockdown began on the 27th of June, which was World PTSD, Post Traumatic Stress Disorder Awareness Day, and we're ending this lockdown, um, the first stage of it, next Monday, hopefully. And Sunday the 10th, the day before, is World Mental Health Day. So we're kind of sandwiched in between trauma and mental health. But it's been interesting, the impact that lockdowns had. Last um, March, um, sorry, last May, the Daily Telegraph reported a study through at Google that the most searched, that searches for prayer reached a peak, unprecedented surge in people searching for prayer. And it's interesting for me as a Christian and as a psychologist, just being aware of some of the research from places like Harvard University, that talk about how our faith can give us a spiritual immune system. And what, what the studies say, it's not Sunday Christianity, it's everyday Christianity actually anchors us in hope and that anchor is firm and secure and can be like that tree that's anchored in the ground that can bend with the wind or with the storm. So in Hebrews 6 it talks about being anchored firm and secure. Even though lockdown has been pretty traumatic, the pandemic has been pretty traumatic, in Western Sydney, I feel very privileged to be dealing with folk from all over the world. Um, and some of the stories are quite, quite challenging. I know of someone who's from the Northern Beaches who said that the pandemic hasn't really affected him. He still goes sailing and kayaking and bushwalking and surfing. So, you know, it's a bit annoying. You can't go to the hairdressers and you have to buy a takeaway. And then for somebody else who's talking about their family back in Vietnam, where lockdown means you're allowed out for an hour with a permit and there's military at the end of your street and thousands of people have died from COVID and hundreds of people have died from starvation. 
because they can't get to the shops and they can't get food. So we certainly as a world are all in this, in the same storm together, but I think um, we're not all in the same boat. I think our journeys with COVID are a little bit different and I want to reflect on that as I talk about our experience with this, just so we can have a bigger picture of what's happening. So grief, there's been so much loss. We've all experienced loss. It doesn't matter where you are on the planet, there's been loss of the normal things that we would do. Being in lockdown, we're cooped up and we can't go out and we can't do the stuff we used to do and everyone over at the beach is going surfing and we're not allowed past five kilometres. Some of us. I wasn't allowed past five kilometres. Um, so we're frustrated, we're, we're exhausted. Lockdown and COVID has brought out this lethargy. Now, why is that? We're creatures of routine. When we can go into automatic pilot, half our brain switches off half the time and we're just doing routine. Driving a car, brushing our teeth, getting dressed. When the circumstances change and we're grieving the loss of our old normal, our brains are switched on all the time, trying to work out what do I need to do? How do I get through this day? What are the tasks? How do I set goals for this day? So we're actually exhausted, we're alone, um, and trying to work out how to best get through the day. So there's lots of grief. We're grieving our work colleagues. We're grieving having the kids going to school. We're grieving holidays. We're grieving that we can't go to weddings and funerals and parties and celebrations. So there's a lot of grief and sadness, but that's actually not the worst part of what's happening with lockdown and COVID. The other thing that's biting us is some of the social issues. Now, we all know this stuff that's happening now, the no jab, no job stuff. I have a few clients who have been terminated because for different reasons, they can't get vaccinated or they're choosing not to get vaccinated. So suddenly being unemployed, not being able to get um, easily find new employment. We've got this comparisonitis as we're looking at what other people can do and what we can't do and the injustice of it and the unfairness of it. And so we've got people rioting and feeling un unheard and unappreciated. And whereas we've got other people who are actually financially doing really well because they can work from home, but folk, some folk don't have that luxury of working from home. We've also got the pressures from our um, all the frontline workers, nursing staff, people who are burning out. I have a few clients who are working in hospitals who are burning out and feeling really frustrated by the, the groundswell or the underground that we still have of the COVID deniers. So the conspiracy theories are alive and well and pockets of people all have different conspiracy theories and they don't line up with each other. So we're also having so much COVID fatigue and lockdown fatigue we're tired of churning through and talking about what's happening. Our mental health is suffering and that's probably the main thing I want to talk about. I do want to make mention, and I think we're on the next slide, is the suicide rates. There's been lots of chatter about suicide rates have gone through the roof. It actually isn't true. Um, sadly, Australia still has a suicide rate of about eight people a, a day kill themselves. That's way too many. About 30 people a day might attempt suicide. These numbers have been like that for a few years now. What we have seen the massive increase is the number of people calling for help. Lifeline has had calls more than they ever have before. And one of the biggest increases is in people talking about suicidal thoughts. People who feel they don't have hope or purpose, they don't have motivation, they can't keep going. So it hasn't translated into a big increase in suicide, not at this point, and hope and prayer that it won't. And the next things that I want to talk about is how we can help to, to turn some of this mental health um, crisis around. We've seen an uptake, an uptick in um, people reaching out for mental health services. It's, we cannot possibly meet the demand. So many colleagues I know have closed their books um, or waiting lists are just getting longer and longer as more and more people are struggling. This lockdown is very different to last year's lockdown. I cycle. I cycle along um, the M7, so it's quite a big stretch. There was a time I could only go 5Ks, but now I've been, I can go further now. Last year, every man and his dog bought a bike 
and you'd go out to the cycleway and there were kids and prams and dogs and people. Every corner you'd turn was almost going to be a collision. This year, nothing changed. There hasn't been an increase in people riding bikes. It's been really interesting. There has been an increase in people walking. It's almost like in the lockdown LGAs in particular, people doing the loop of the prison yard. <laughs> Heads down, shoulders hunched, masks on, nobody talking or acknowledging each other because you have a face mask, you can't make, you can't have chitter chatter, you're not allowed to stop. And there was a time in the lockdown LGAs that if you stopped and sat on a park bench, except for catching your breath, you could be given a personal infringement notice. And that was really confronting, people being handcuffed for not wearing face masks. So there's been lots of lots of issues that have been happening, even if we're not in a lockdown LGA, just seeing the vision of the disparity. You know, this whole sense of Sydney being a tale of two cities, um, and that's fueled a lot of unsettledness. So there's a thing called the shadow pandemic that seems to run underground or beside the actual impact of COVID and the, the sickness that that brings. So this shadow pandemic brings with it a lot of depression. Now, depression typically shows itself in spikes of anger and agitation and irritation and fatigue and lethargy and no motivation, losing hope and purpose, um, finding it hard to find joy in anything. So there's a flatness, there's a groundhog dayness about what we're doing every day. So this actually has a name and it existed. It, it's, COVID didn't create it. It's something called dysthymic disorder. So don't everybody go and self-diagnose. But if you're starting to feel that flatness, that no joy, it actually is a real clinical thing that happens to people. It doesn't mean that you can't work. It's not major depressive disorder. Major depressive disorder is you curl up in bed, pull the blankets over your head and don't talk to me. Life, there's no point. When we've got something dysthymic disorder, we feel trapped, we don't have a choice, um, we're powerless, um, there's no point to anything, I can keep going because I have to keep going, but I'm losing joy. Now that's something that I can see different this time round with lockdown and COVID than what we saw last year. Last year, even though it was unprecedented, nobody knew what was going to happen, we did have, there was more than the novelty. Everyone was in, boots and all, to, to fight their way through and to recover and overcome. Whereas this time round, the, the heaviness, there's, there's, a, there's a sense of dread. It's almost like COVID has created this sense of an existential sense of unsafety around the world. Now, when we've got that sense of unsafety or not knowing, we typically get triggered in life, fight, flight. So when I'm in fight, flight, my body's being activated. That's really exhausting. So how does the body experience this existential feeling of unsafety? It, it impacts the nervous system around our heart and our lungs and in the viscera, the organs in our belly. So we feel it. We, we feel this sense of dis-ease and unsettledness. So COVID's actually causing changes in our nervous system. It's causing changes in the way we're reacting to stress because it's this, this worldwide dread. And we're having things, it's good that we've had three days without those 11 o'clock briefings, but we're having so much trauma information. We're having so much vicarious trauma, particularly when we were seeing the bodies burning in India and the mass graves in New York. So we actually, we need to limit all of that. The other thing that we're seeing that couples with this depression um, is anxiety and confusion and fear. Fear is a really big one. So we've got all of these, these mental health issues that are causing us to feel unsettled and agitated. So it's making us not able to sleep properly. So we're exhausted, but we can't sleep. And the other thing that happens, we then start ruminating, we overthink, and our brains can go over the things that we're worried about what might happen or worried about what we should have done and how badly we're performing. So we become more critical of self, more critical of other, and don't have much to look forward to. 
So that all sounds pretty gloomy. So what can we do about this? There's some really good things, four simple things. Now it's really interesting. Um, the number one thing in managing our mental health, when Jesus was asked, what is the most important commandment? He said, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and body, to love your neighbour as yourself. So the most important thing in managing mental health is connection. There's nothing more powerful and potent than being in a reciprocal relationship, reciprocal attunement with another person who gets us, sees us, values us and cares about us. Now, there's restrictions around that with COVID in terms of bubbles and lockdowns, and, but we're in a very blessed era where we can do a lot of FaceTiming and, and Zooming and all these other technical things, which, which is a blessing so long as we manage that. But connection is the number one thing. One of the things that I love about the Bible is how powerfully it speaks to our mental health. Even though it was written way before we even had words or understanding about mental health. When God created, when God created everything, um, if we look at the Genesis story, and it talks about how um, everything that he made, the land and the trees and the birds and the sea and the sky, everything was good, 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 good. Until the very first not good that ever existed in all of creation. It's not good for man, for people, to be alone. Now I know that was talking about Adam and Eve, but it's a really powerful statement. The first not good, it's not good to be alone. All of our research now in psychology, psychiatry, science, and the schools of thought, things like the polyvagal theory that you don't need to worry about, but schools of thought, how this reciprocity creates this sense of attunement, which actually helps to activate our parasympathetic nervous system. I know it's a lot of big words, but what it means is when I connect with other, it helps me to calm down. It helps me to get back in touch with a sense of safety and, hey, this is going to be okay. Isn't it amazing where the Bible says where two or more of you are gathered together, there I am in your midst. Now, I don't want to overstate that, but as a psychologist, where two or more are gathered together, special connection happens. When we gather together in God's name, then he's there, but special connection happens. When we're talking about managing trauma, this is now one of the main things that we look at, is how do we create safety and connection when people are feeling vulnerable because that's the number one curative thing that helps us overcome and get through. It's amazing. So we need to be really mindful of the folk who are living alone, of the singles, of widows, of people who have loved ones in hospitals, people who have loved ones overseas. We need to be really mindful, even if we're in busy, bustling households and able to work from home, there's many people who are feeling really isolated. And that connection is lacking for them and we know that's the number one. Send a text, um, say hi over Zoom or Facebook, stay in touch. Send care packages. I've sent a few during lockdown. Um, it makes a difference when people receive something, they feel remembered. The second thing that's really important is optimistic thinking. Now, I don't just mean... Um, I'm a princess and I deserve everything wonderful. I don't mean that sort of stuff. Hundreds of years ago, or the father of psychology, so many people have come up with the understanding that mental health issues, trauma, isn't caused by the things that actually happen to us. Our mental health distress is caused by how we think about the things that happen to us. So our distress isn't necessarily from the things that happen, it's from how we think about it. If I can think, yeah, this is tough, but I'll get through it, then I'm going to get through it much better. A whole lot of um, family therapy research, this is done a few decades ago, looked at the difference for people when they had crisis, trauma, tragedy, death happen to a family member in a family context. It was the vast majority of people got through that and how they got through was because they could say things like, I hated that. That was really hard, but we grew closer because of it. I learnt so much from that. 
I feel like I'm a better, stronger person. I hated it. I never want to go through it again. But I feel like I've grown and learnt something. I think that's a really important message um, that we can challenge how we think. There's probably three key things in our optimistic thinking. Now, some of this comes from a guy called Martin Seligman, a positive psychology. You also don't need to worry about that. I just mention it in case someone out there is going, oh, I'm going to look that up. Um, but Martin Seligman talks about how it's really important to challenge our thinking when we're overwhelmed by something. First one, we can feel like, why is this happening to me? I had this new job happening, or it was my wedding, or it was my 21st, or I was going overseas, or I was moved, buying a house somewhere else. There was plans and dreams and hopes that have been dashed, and it's not fair why this is happening to me. It's really important to be aware that this is not personal, that this is something that all of humanity is sharing. This is something that's having huge impacts for everyone around the planet, for rich, for poor, for first world countries, for third world countries. It's having a huge impact. It's not personal. So I need to shift my thinking. No, this isn't just so annoying because of what's happening to me and in my little bubble. I need to be able to broaden my view what's happening to all of us. The second one is to be really mindful that this isn't pervasive. COVID does not impact every square centimetre, millimetre of life. We need to be able to hold, hold on to the and. So what do I mean by the and? Yes, COVID is impacting a lot of things in my life and I still have phone contact with my kids and I can still do the gardening and I can still go cycling along the M7 and I still have a job and I still have food I can eat. So we need to not get into that global catastrophic thinking that my whole life is screwed and every area of my life is impacted. Even when you have screaming kids at home and, and you're on an important Zoom meeting, um, so is a vast number of people in the world going through the same thing. One of my daughters works for Amazon and her boss is in Texas. So they've gone through a lot of the, the homeschooling before us. So when my daughter has a baby on one knee and a three-year-old crawling at her feet, her boss is just, don't worry about it, been there, done that, you'll get through it. So to have that attitude, this is hard, don't deny that it's hard, but it actually does not inhabit every space in our life. The third thing is being aware that it's not permanent that this is not going to last forever. We can feel like it's over, my life is never coming back. Our life will be different, but you know, even without COVID, every day of your life is different. So yes, we'll, come, we'll find a new normal. No, life, life won't go back to the way it was. My life won't go back to the way it was when I was 21 or 25 or 30 or life changes and moves forward. That's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just the way life is. So I think if we can have those three attitudes, I think being able to grab hold of our thinking in this is really important. The more we rehearse any thoughts in our head, the more permanent those thoughts become. So if I dwell on everything that's dark and gloomy, my mood is going to get dark and gloomy. The Bible's really clever. In Philippians, it says, whatever's pure and noble and good and praiseworthy, etc., etc., dwell on these things. What a good cognitive behavioural therapist Paul was. <laughs> oh my goodness. What, what inhabits our head is going to impact our heart. So I want my head to be inhabited with good thoughts, with hopeful thoughts. The other thing is I like in 2 Corinthians, Paul also says that we need to um, take hold of our thoughts. We need to make them captive. Make our thoughts captive. Now I know it's talking about so we can challenge thoughts um, uh, conversations that are anti-God, but the whole point that Paul says we need to take our thoughts captive and make them subject to Christ actually means we can take our thoughts captive and make them subject to Christ. Otherwise, it wouldn't be in the Bible. And psychologically, that is one of the most potent strategies in things like cognitive behavioural therapy, dialectical behaviour therapy, solution-focused therapy, etc., etc., is how we take charge of the thoughts in our head. We can 
we can worry ourselves into more and more and more worry or we can change channels in our head. And we're still acknowledging that COVID is tough, but we're going to ride this wave. The third thing is radical acceptance. What does that mean? We go, yay, bring it on, I love COVID. No, it doesn't mean that. Years ago, probably halfway through last century, one of the most profound things that came out of psychology was that one of the most foundational things for good mental health is the acceptance of the fact that what is, is. So in other words, accepting the hand I've been dealt. We can think about Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane when he was, God, hey, could you please take this away? I don't think I like this, paraphrasing. And then Jesus says, it's okay though, not my will, your will. Even Joseph, Genesis, when he says, you guys meant this stuff for bad, you can read the story in Genesis, but God meant this for good. It's okay, it's okay. I can ride this wave. Jesus could ride this wave. We can ride this wave. So radical acceptance is accepting the truth, the fact, this is what's happening. And I'm going to do my very best with the hand that I've been dealt, whatever that looks like. If I try and rail against the things I have no control over, that's going to increase my depression. One of the factors in depression is having no control. <laughs> so I can have control over my thoughts, over my mood, how I spend my day. Um, we, there are things that we can manage. Then the fourth one is self-care. So let's flip over. I've just got a few skills there. So it might be click, click, click to the list of some of our um, self-care and coping skills. And then we're almost finished, ready for all those questions. Um, the self-care we've talked about, connection, is probably, well, it is the number one thing. Don't try and do this on your own. Um, we also need to hang on to hope that this is going to pass. And we need to have gratitude for the good things that we have in our life and not get consumed with the negative things and the things that we can't do. Um, my daughter was supposed to come home for Christmas um, last year, and that didn't happen. And then we were supposed to go to Spain this year, and that didn't happen. Um, there's many family gatherings and birthdays that we, couldn't, we, we can't do those things. But we can be grateful for the fact that we still have connection. And it's important to actually verbalise them and identify them and reflect on them and own the things we can be grateful for. We need to have mindfulness and breathing sounds really silly, but it's really important. When we get stressed, we shallow breathe. When we shallow breathe, we don't fill our lungs, we don't oxygenate our blood, and we don't get good oxygen into our heads. When I'm shallow breathing, I'm more likely to panic. When I'm shallow breathing, I'm more likely to feel anxiety. So if I can practice slow, deep breathing for three to five minutes a day, that's not very long, I'm much more likely to calm down, I'm going to activate my parasympathetic nervous system. That's going to happen and that's going to help me calm down and focus, feel less afraid. So I need to be mindful. When I'm bike riding, I purposely don't focus on all the stresses that are happening. I try to focus on the birds and the trees and the lack of cars on the M7. Oh my goodness. I try to focus on pedalling and muscles and... and clear my head of all the stresses because we need those opportunities that we can just give our heads a break. We need to be exercising. Australian Medical Association says we need to be exercising a minimum of one hour a day. Are you serious? Who can do that? <laughs> my recommendation is we exercise at least three times a week for 20 minutes a day. However, if you only exercise once a week for one minute, go you. You've done one minute. And the goal is, let's increase that. Let's try and get more activity and exercise happening. Because the two things, we've got to manage what's happening in our head, manage what's happening in our bodies. So exercise also is going to release serotonin. Serotonin is a hormone that lifts mood. It's going to help us to feel better. Exercise is going to help us to sleep better as well. When I say activity, I mean gardening. Um, be busy with hobbies. Um, Get up and, and have things that you enjoy doing, whether it's painting or Lego or craft. Routine and novelty. So routine is important. We need to get up, make our beds, get dressed, have breakfast, um, have a routine in the day. That's really important. We need to have structure and we need to have novelty. So that might mean, if you're someone who's never done jigsaw puzzles, that could be a new thing that you're doing. 
someone who's never listened to that particular sort of music, great, let's do that. Someone, new things, new things really st stimulate um, brain growth. It actually helps us to feel more invigorated. So something new, something different that we haven't done before. And we need to eat well and drink plenty of water. I can't stress that, and I'm sure that we're aware of that. Um, self-awareness and self-compassion give ourselves a break. We're actually, many of us, are going to feel like we're achieving less every day because we don't have the same structure or we feel like we should have done more by now. We need to have self-compassion and realise we're doing the best we can and realise this isn't going to last forever, that we are going to come back to a new sense of normal. We need to treat ourselves with kindness and we need to monitor what it is that we need. If we need some time out, if we need a break, then we need to be kind to ourselves and down tools when we need to. The last one is actually a scary one for post-lockdown. We need to be managing our new addictions. Now, what do I mean by that? The Australian government, before lockdown, recommended that healthy screen time, apart from work, is two hours a day. That includes TV, phones, iPads, games, screens, two hours a day apart from work. We are all way past that. So it's managing our um, changing those patterns and that's going to be particularly difficult for young people. But it's actually really unhealthy in terms of brain development for little people to be having hours of screen every day. Now, it's been a vital thing for homeschooling and for everybody surviving, but that one in particular, we need to put some hardcore effort into weaning ourselves and our kids off our devices because one of the studies done decades ago, a couple of decades ago, was looking at the drop in empathy. And the drop in empathy seemed to be the more as technology was increasing so we actually need this connection thing, face-to-face -face connection with people so that we can stay that attunement with one another. Too much time on screens is actually damaging that. So we need to be focused on weaning everybody from our screens. Um, and a lot of us have picked up other things like um, shopping. Online shopping is, has become a bit of a thing. People feeling so bored that they're buying, buying, buying. Alcohol has become an increased problem um, and all the bottle owners have stayed open where other retail can't. Um, gambling has become an increased issue. Um, porn has become an increased issue. Now, I say that in the church because I've seen many, many, many Christians who struggle with porn addiction, not because they're evil, bad people, but because it's out there and easily accessible and we prey on um, people's passions but we need to be mindful of whatever addictive behaviours you've developed because addictions, we get hooked on things that bring us comfort. We want something that's going to ease some of the pain and the distraction. But that's going to be a challenge as we come out of lockdown, as we come out of COVID. How do, how do we adjust these things in our life? The very last thing that I wanted to put up for us is something called the Healthy Mind Platter. Now, this was developed by Dan Siegel, the guy I spoke about at the very beginning, who said that being flexible and adaptable is one of the best signs of good mental health. So he talks about these seven things that we need to be doing for good mental health. So we need to have regular sleep time, seven to nine hours. Some of us struggle with that, particularly in lockdown. We need to have physical time. I've already talked about that. We need to have focus time. Focus time is where I'm learning something. I might be doing Bible study or reading that article or enjoying that book where I'm learning stuff. Connecting time, we've talked about that. We need to have people in our life who we care about and they care about us. We need to have play time. We need to have fun. We need to dance. We need to laugh. We need to play games with our kids. We need to play games with one another. We need to have fun. And for some of us, that's been having a one-hour picnic um, if you're all vaccinated. But that's changed a little bit now, which is good. But we need to be able to have fun. Downtime is where I do nothing. I might just lie on a blanket under a tree. I just chill. We need to have time where there's just no responsibility 
and we don't have to do anything. And we need to have time in, which is self-reflection time. I have to have self-awareness before self-regulation. I need to be touching base with what's happening for me. Who am I? Have I been travelling this road well? Are there things I need to address? So this is a good, sound mental health platter. School kids are given this. Just like they're given the healthy eating pyramid in schools, they're also given this in America. So they can start thinking from a young age about how do I stay well in my head. Okay, that's probably the main stuff that I wanted to briefly share with everyone. Well, thank you, Colleen. Really appreciate that. Um, look, there's a lot of good stuff in there and a lot of it I didn't know, so I, I've been sort of hanging on a lot of those words. Um, I think it's going to be very difficult for us to get our three-year-old off screen time, I've got to say. <laughs> yes. um, but as I was thinking that, my very next thought is it's actually going to be very difficult to wean myself off screen time, I think. <laughs> I think that, that just hit the spot. Um, we're going to go to a brief song now from uh, Colin Buchanan, a country artist who's also a Christian. Um, it'll go for about three minutes just to take a little bit of a breather and a break from this. Um, feel free to message your questions through if we can put the number up on the screen again 0402 um, and uh, just look it's we've probably got about 15 minutes for questions once we come back from the song so we'll see you shortly crystal and sweet Long may the white sand be warm at your feet May the cool water shimmer in the bush scented breeze Embraced by the mercies of God Long may you cherish the hands that you hold and Count flesh and blood Precious than gold May you stand on the turrets And look out to sea Embraced by the mercies of God Strong hands Holy hands Under, beside and before Blessings held long in the heart the Treasured companions You cross on this path Though weary and parched May your souls be refreshed Embraced by the mercies of God Strong hands Holy hands Under Side and before strong hands, holy hands, the faithful can always be sure of the tender embrace of the Lord, the tender embrace of the Lord. Oh 
Well, we're back again uh, with Colleen Hurst. Thank you, Colleen, for your um, wisdom earlier, uh, no which, which I found incredibly engaging. Uh, look, we have some questions that have come through. There's still time to, to send your questions through if you'd like to uh, on the SMS number 0402 423282. Now, the first one we've got is, have you got any tips for coming out of lockdown? And there's a little suffix to this question. We've developed a routine at home and the idea of going back to a busy, crazy life is a little overwhelming. Oh, yes. A lot of people have enjoyed the fact that we can all slow down a bit and relax. And that a lot of the pressure has come, come off, particularly the social activities that happen on weekends. There's been a bit of a breather. For some folk who struggle with social anxiety as well, at the best of times, they've actually loved lockdown. They've really enjoyed the fact that I just don't have to deal with all that awkward social engagement. I can still watch everything online, but I can turn my camera off or I can mute. So I'm still there, but there's no pressure on me. So there's a few different things, um, positives for people being in lockdown, whether it's the reduced pressure and we can breathe or the fact that my social anxiety um, is is really loving it. So I think the very best way to start coming out um, is to be taking use of the, the walking, the getting out, engaging uh, with people, making eye contact as you're walking around. I think to be picking up the phone, to be sending text mes messages, to be slowly connecting. I think we actually are really good at change. We don't like change, but every single day of our life, things are changing. Like we're, we're, growing, we're growing older. So it's going to be really confronting, particularly when we finally got things organised. I remember when my husband used to go away on an overseas trip. I've got five kids. I would get the routine nailed. The house was clean. Everything was organised. We had a great routine, given that life had to be structured. Um, and then the second my husband walked in the door, it was like the entire house just went <laughs> and just went to chaos. So there are some things about having that structure and that control, but we also need to let go of that because we don't want to live in a prison. No matter how comfortable that prison might be, it's slowly starting to engage, starting to make contact, go out, put the picnic blanket, whatever the, the, the rules are that you're allowed to do in your LGA, go and be present with humanity. Go and put aside some of the comfortable routine and spend a day riding a bike, having a picnic, going to the park. We need to start shaking it up. Excellent. Yeah. It sounds a bit like relearning a skill, doesn't it? You haven't, you know, reflexing <laughs> yes. a muscle that you haven't flexed for a yes. while. Um, yeah. I can certainly relate to that. It's actually funny in my LGA, there's a lot of green space, a lot of parks, but they're not places where you'd normally go for a picnic. You know, their kids might kick ball around or play. It's the weirdest thing that we have picnic blankets now in every green space in our suburb. It's actually lovely. It's the community is engaging. It's actually it's a really nice thing to see. Wonderful. That is so good to hear. Um, okay, second question that's comes through. Um, I have a friend who's struggling, but when I try to reach out to them, they push me away, and they're also judgmental of others. Do you have any suggestions for how to relate to them? Yep, that stuff is really classic signs of depression. You know, we get bitter, we get agitated, we're judgmental, um, we're intolerant of other people because we just feel so terrible. And, you know, joy, um, there's a verse in Joel that I love. It talks about when the plagues of locusts came, one plague and then another plague and then another plague. You know, one thing after the other. And in Australia, we have had the bushfires and the floods and then COVID. We've had, and now this lockdown that's gone on forever, talks about Joel says, and the joy of mankind had withered. That's a good description of depression. So when somebody's in that space, we need to not listen so much to the words that are coming because I know when I'm in a bad mood, I'm, I'm not as cheery and positive in the things that I say, but when my mood lifts, I'm much more... My, my, the gloomy glasses come off and I can be more realistic. So we still need to reach out to that person and love them not get into debates about what they're saying, not get into debates about Gladys or Scott Morrison or Dan Andrews, or just don't get into those debates. There's, there's, it doesn't achieve anything. But rather be focused on caring for that person, 
send them a box of chocolates, um, a text message, a funny meme, um, looking forward to seeing you. We just need to be persistent in reaching out for peop to people because it's really easy to love the people who are easy to love, but we really need to get better at loving the people who are hard to love mm. because Jesus came to reach out for the people, you know, for the, uh, you know, that saying, the doctor came for the sick people. Mm. We need to be able to reach out when people are doing it hard and not take it personally yeah. if they say, yeah. go away. They're doing it hard. They're going to say mean things sometimes. We're going to say mean things sometimes. Yep. So I'd hate people to not want to talk to me every time I just was in a bad mood and, you know, just said, go away. We need to be persistent. Wonderful. A great challenge. Um, in terms of getting kids back to school, we've got a question here. So our kids uh, have settled into the routine of schooling from home and it's working for them. And um, how do we get them back to school? How do we transition them back to school? Um, I think it's going to be hard. I think that is the case because kids like to be home. They like having mum and dad. They like not having all the pressures and they can go and play when they want. And, you know, it's quite a comfortable, nice routine. So kids are going to balk a little bit in going back to school, but that's okay. We just need to be persistent, not get cranky with them, but rather encourage them um, that they can do this. Some of us might lean towards homeschooling. I'll just raise a flag there. Nothing wrong with homeschooling. Homeschooling, fantastic, so long as you can provide the social developmental needs of little people. So brains develop in a social context. So our kids need to go back to school or if you do want to do the homeschooling, that's fine, but you need to link up with homeschool networks. You need to link up with other families. You need to link your kids up with other kids. Me personally, I think it's easier to send them to school, <laughs> <laughs> but we just need to be patient. And sometimes they might show some of that separation anxiety. A really important point about that, anxiety breeds anxiety. If mums and dads are more worried about their kids going to school, the kids are going to pick that up. It's contagious. We have Dan Siegel talks about these invisible connections between two people's brains. It's very strong between parents and children. So if mum and dad are stressing, kids understandably are going to be, no, this is dangerous. I don't want to go. So we need to also limit what we say to our kids. We need to limit the conversations about COVID. And the kids who are going to struggle the most with anxiety are the 10 to 13 year olds because they're just starting to be able to process and pick up what's happening, but they're not old enough to process it properly. So we need to be really mindful of our early high school, later primary school kids and how stressed what they're picking up. Mm. And I might ask a follow-up question. I'm going to be selfish here because I've got an almost 11-year-old, so mm. I'm going to go through exactly what you just talked about. Um, how do we help them to make that last step of processing it properly? So if they're starting to process it but not quite getting there properly, is there anything we can do for that? I think group? we can say the safe, the safe things like that it's really good. COVID seems to be mutating, if they, it depend, if they already know some things, into something much less dangerous. So that's really exciting. Gosh, that's good. Mm -hmm. Wow, they're developing these new drugs. It's awesome. We're very blessed that we live in an era where there's so much good science around. So we don't need to go into a debate with them, but they just need to know messages of hope and OK, with little bits of information sewn in there. Not just, we'll be right, but little bits. Like mm. if they've heard some things, particularly those two-hour Back in the day when Gladys and Kerry Chant and it just felt like it went on forever and we all left traumatised, um, sometimes kids have picked some of that up. Yeah. So we also need to say we're nowhere near that anymore. And our numbers are coming down, people are getting healthy, we're coming out of lockdown, it's really good news. And those, that's good news for all of us, I think, isn't it? Not yeah. just our, not yeah. just our ten to thirteen year olds. Um, a question's just come through: How do we manage the new connections we have made in lockdown when the new normal starts, when they no longer need us as much? I.e., how to go from meeting every week to once in a while, as it was before COVID. That's a really good question because I have a few clients who have had more connection, and they're really worried that they're going to be forgotten that it's really nice that folk from church have made the effort to connect with them, 
but it's going to be sad when lockdown ends because they won't have time for me anymore. So it goes both ways, that it's, we all need each other. We actually all need each other. I personally think the very best way to negotiate that is to have a conversation about it. And if, if we feel that we've just done something um, for the lockdown term, that we've been making an effort for someone in isolation because they can't get out, I actually think we can treat each other as, as adults and have that conversation and say, you know, I'm going back to work and you'll be going back out to work. I've really enjoyed our bubble every week, but we probably don't need to do that. But I'd, st I'd still love to catch up with you for coffee once a fortnight or once a week mm. or whatever it might be. So let's not feel forgotten because people don't need us, but let's not forget people and then they feel not worthy. So it, there's going to be a two-way street and it just means that we'd be mindful that people aren't projects. I haven't done something because it was ministry. I've done something because I care yeah. and I want to keep that connection. It'll just change though because we won't have as much time when we come out of lockdown. Yeah, look, very important. Yeah. And look, the last message in this isn't a question, but uh, is to say thank you. Um, and it says, great focus time for my healthy mind platter. So thank you for sharing <laughs> that with us. What an and, awesome and, comment. And, and, and we might, if we can, um, put some of this material up on our, on our Facebook page, sort of to the extent that we're, we can share it, because I think there's some, been yes. some great stuff there that people yes. might want to might refer to. That's no problem at all. Thank you. All right. Well, look, thank you, Colleen. I think we're at the end of the questions, but really appreciate you sharing with us tonight and taking questions on the spot. Um, it's been incredibly helpful. Hmm. Um, and yeah, as we come out of lockdown, let's hope we can do it well and be all the more equipped because of what you've shared with us tonight. Yes, please. Yeah. Thank you. Um, now, as St John's Asketh, we have a couple of events coming up that we'll just let you know about before we close off tonight. Um, the first is actually this Sunday at 10 o'clock in the morning, which is, our, which is our normal church service, but it's not a normal church service. Um, it's actually this year our 100th anniversary, our centenary at St John's. Um, and after a false start earlier in the year when it was actually the weekend, uh, this weekend we're going to celebrate. Um, and so it'll be online, uh, as church services are, but we'll have uh, a number of videos and contributions from people who've lives, whose lives have been touched by this church uh, over, we probably won't go back 100 years, but certainly in the last living memory uh, of the church. And we'll also be launching a book that we've written this year, which is a compilation of people's experiences of St John's uh, that's called 100 Stories to God's Glory. So uh, same channel on Facebook and YouTube, 10 o'clock Sunday, uh, and I think it's going to be an incredibly encouraging time with a lot to thank God for there. And then next week uh, on, on uh, Thursday, so just over a week today, uh, one of our members, Rob Elder, is going to be sharing with us where is God uh, in COVID. And that's uh, Rob works at, um, with the, the Christian group at the University of Technology. Um, mm. So he's, been, he's prepared these talks and delivered them there uh, and he's going to share them with us as well. That will be a Zoom call, so it won't be a Facebook YouTube stream. And if you're interested in the link for that, which we'll send out in the coming week, um, you can just message us on the number that was up tonight, 0402 423282, uh, or you can email us at St John's Asquith, uh, oh, sorry, office at stjohnsasquith.org.au, uh, and Jenny, our office administrator, will be able to point you in the right uh, direction there as well. Um, Colleen, again, thank you for tonight. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, for tuning in and being with us tonight. Uh, have a great week and God bless. <laughs>